It's now two minutes of the tape. Perfect. Okay. Welcome everyone and to another I Tuesday session today. So it's the I2 Coastal Cape Town team that's presenting today. It's a beautiful sunny day in Cape Town. Lovely weather. So yeah, we're very thankful for this beautiful day. So today we will unpack PI with specific focus on the Western Cape. We have four speakers today, two internal and then two guest speakers from Bowman's, Bonnie Stain and Jay Page, both based here in Cape Town. And I'll just give you a little uh, summary of their bios. So Bonnie Stain is a partner and specializes in litigation and dispute resolution with particular emphasis on medical law and malpractice, professional indemnity insurance and personal injury. Her expertise extends to advising, advising leading insurance companies on the policy response, interpretation, and wording. She has a BCom and LLB degrees from Stellenbosch University and a certificate of, in medicine and law from UNISA. She's also an admitted attorney, notary, and conveyancer. Jay Page is a senior associate with particular expertise in insurance and risk complex personal injury, as well as the health care and life science field. He provides problem solving and advice, as well as litigation and ADR expertise. He advises on commercial claims, regulatory issues, medical malpractice, complex personal injury claims, litigation and dispute resolution. Jay has a business science honors and LRB degree from UCT. Uh, just slide. Okay. Um, so I just want to go to the next slide. You can use the arrow down, um, arrow side key. It'll move it down. No, it doesn't work doesn't work. Um, what do you point that on it? Luckily, we still got brokers that are joining in. So this is just a little delay so everybody can hear what you guys have got to say. Morning, Rob Ferguson. See, Rob Fergie has joined us this morning. Okay, got it. Okay, so before we kick off, I just want to introduce the coastal team. So the whole coastal consists of two branches, one in Cape Town and one in Durban. So the picture here is just the Cape Town team. So, in, but in total, we're 19 passionate multi-lined experts with a total gross return premium of, of 230 million and still growing. And then I would like to also introduce our Coastal Claims Manager, uh, Marissa van der Westeisen. She's um, um, based in Joburg, but also admitted attorney. And she recently uh, was allocated to the Western Cape as the Coastal Claims Manager. And then I just want to share the agenda for today before I hand over to Tian. So this is the agenda for today. You will start off with the economic indicators in the Western Cape economy and also just share a little bit on PI 101. And then from there, Marissa will chat about claims and then from there, Bonnie and Jay. And at the end, there will be a QA. and a So if you have any questions, just pop it into the chat box and we will have a look at it at the end. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tian. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm just rolling in. I see we've got 606 people attending, seven. So, wow. Okay, that's quite good. I'm glad 
PI is so well received. So for those of you that don't know me outside of the um, Western Cape, so I'm Tian Erasmus, um, been with IT for about 15 years now, and uh, look after the Western Cape and Kuzulu Natal. So I'm going to today, you know, we got, we're going to talk about PI and then from there we're going to, oh, so we're first going to try and uh, paint a contextual picture um, from there, you know, kind of, kind of move into Western Cape specifically. Um, and as you know, we want to kind of give our Western Cape brokers some specific points. We think this is a great area where they can also expand their practices, um, then into PI and then into claims. So as much as this is PI, I'm going to try and stay away from an actual underwriting um session today or underwriting lessons so i just want to i'm going to ask someone in my team to hand me my water please um thank you so yeah i'm not really good with putting together slides so it, everything pops up at once so no real surprises there but i do think it's important to provide some context for um for our brokers down there i mean we after all still in the financial in institution environment so as you know south africa is one of the top three economies in africa and whilst i know it's africa and it's it's not exactly a californian economy i think it's still something to be proud of we're up a middle income country um, you know, also whilst, you know, most of the indexes, you know, it is sinking a little bit, but we still 25th out of um, 32, uh, 25th out of 32 um, countries for private business um, environment investments. So, yeah, according to the MIA Private Business Attractiveness Index, population of 60 million um, 60, a very young population, you know, comparing to Europe, where we've got an aging population, so 69% of the population with an working age uh, category, um, and 62.65% of people um, in South Africa under 34 years of age. So we go on to the next slide, now that the slides are, are working. Kind of want to give a, oh, and just if you look at the, um, actually should have started with that in the beginning before we started, the jack of all trades, masters of everything. So when it comes to the whole Western Cape, so we're going to dive into a little bit about the Western Cape for those of you that don't really know the Western Cape and only see um, a, a table mountain and we do pay a mountain tax. We can't build decent highways. But um, yeah, so I think, you know, what we've put on when we discussed it, you know, myself, Bonnie, Jay, Marissa, Natalie, Lenisa and the team on this is that, you know, when you're in a branch environment, you are jack of all trades and masters of everything. So we, you know, you've, you've, you've got to build your own resources around everything. I think the branch also, Natalie might have mentioned, you know, the, the, the two branches are really built client centric versus um, product centric in Johannesburg, we've got a specific product cluster. So anyway, I needed to mention that and also throw in a little bit of advertising. So yeah, I'm done with that. Um, yeah, just some interesting numbers on GWP. So it's so, oh, and I just also need to, we just need to also mention the source, which is West Grove. So forgot to put that into our um, presentation, but yeah, so 2022, you know, we've got a GWP of uh, 360 billion rand, Western Cape 51 billion. Um, of that, the GWP per capita, okay, that didn't in US dollars um, for the country. Sorry, that didn't come out nicely there. Now, where's my little point to now, but um, it's 5,800 5, US dollars and in the Western Cape, 7,000. So, you know, it would kind of suggest that it's a richer province. Um, GWP percentage per capita, 2.04 for the country and Western Cape, 2.47. Um, and then South Africa, GWP, this doesn't make, yeah, growth rate of, that doesn't make sense. I think it's more, that should be in inflation. Um, so just to start that as inflation is at, was in 2022 at seven and a half and 6.9. And then in, unemployment rate, I think is something that we're particularly proud of as a 32 uh, countrywide, it's 32.7%. We know that's of course official stats, um, whereas Western Cape is 22.5. Um, the just you will see sort of a little footnote there the exchange rate at the time that they used was um 17 rands for one us dollar so if you want to do a couple of a couple of um do a bit of maths in your head and then just the population breakdown how 10 26 percent of the population 
KZN 19, Western Cape 12, and then the rest um, of South Africa is at 43. So yeah, so just some interesting, um, some interesting sets. So we're going to move into, again, like I said, just the idea was not to provide a, a, um, a lesson in PI 101, but really just to provide some context as to how did we get there and, you know, why does professional services make up such a big part of um, the Western Cape economy. And I think also, interestingly enough, Natalia spoke about, you know, just more or less the GWP written for I2, but it's interesting that, um, you know, looking at the Cape Town and Durban branch, where 70% of our income is written through professional services, whether it be financial institutions, PI, um, you know, or anything in the service sector, medical malpractice, whereas the Durban branch, again, very much 70% of the income is general liability, which is, um, again, manufacturing. So, you know, even though we look at these or you know, when we look at um, official numbers, you know, we can also see it in our own numbers, which is actually quite interesting and unique. And I think if there were other insurers on this, they would have probably seen the same. But yeah, agriculture, I'm very passionate about this industry. For those of you that do remember last year, I spoke about, about agriculture and general liability claims there. And by that, I'm, I'm passionate about the actual industry. Um, but yeah, it's a key sector in terms of jobs, um, exports and contribution for the Western Cape. And remember now, this is Western Cape. Um, gross domestic product is a huge historic significance and, and also a backbone of the regional economy. You know, so for those of you that do know, once you go through Paul and you go through the tunnel, um, you know, there's a regional economy that's not always necessarily made up of professional services and professional services then become um, fragmented as in where there's demand. Um, crop production covers 2 million hectares of agricultural land. So largest is wheat production, you know, whereas KZN Free State, again, you know, you would have, um, you know, it, it would be less crop, it would be cattle um, or any other type of meat. Well, meat, I can't think of the English word. In any event, um, the other major crops in the Western Cape, of course, are wine grapes. So for those of you that don't know that, um, canola, um, up here the N2, swell and down that area, barley, rooibos. Uh, we've got apples, um, table grapes, not only in the Northern Cape, but down here as well. Um, and then, you know, is what we would just say in Africa, so pears and oranges. Um and then with growth industry, which is blueberries, um, and then strangely enough, cannabis. So yeah, we're not going to talk about cannabis today. But yeah, main export destinations for us are Netherlands, United Kingdom, and China. So this was in 2022. And I think for those of you that also followed um, you know, the whole issue with South Africa's, um, you know, with all with um, the North American export markets and AGOA, strangely enough, whilst the Western Cape, you know, sort of did an intervention on, you know, on, on behalf of the South African government, we've got the main export um, designations being Netherlands, United Kingdom, um, and which one was the other one that I say? China, you know, so thanks for that. So yeah, that's why this is a team effort. Um, and then tourism sector, I think well known to most of you. So but some interesting fact is that international tourism exceed pre-pandemic levels by 104 and growing 76% year on year. 9% um, of the Western, uh, Western Cape gross regional product, as well as 9% also employ 9% of the um, province workforce. Then interestingly enough, and case at the end of the world, we've got a different ocean economy sector, but of course, as you can imagine, we've got an ocean economy sector. I know Gauteng has got a Valdam economy sector with boats and houses, but we've got an ocean economy sector, both world-class uh, boat building industry, um, you know, is with a second largest producer of regional catamarans after France in the world. And then, of course, we're famous for our fishing industry, um, hake being a major export um, product. So, but, you know, for those of you that do know, I always say if you want fresh fish, you can go to Hout Bay and then Hout Ten. That's where all the fresh fish are. So don't bother going anywhere else. And then energy supply sector, um, you know, we, we are really positioning ourselves as a regional champion for that. I think that's well publicized in, in mainstream media, um, production of composite wind turbines and undergreen energy components. 
um, you know, so IPPs, you know, so this was even last year, so we would assume it's even more, you know, up to a total of produced, um, you know, at the time, um, 8,200 gigawatts of electricity. So, you know, you're probably wondering when are we getting to PI? So we're starting there. Um, like I said, so we're trying to build into PI and why we've chosen PI specifically. Uh, the Durban team chose um, a different uh, topic. They spoke about um, pollution and, and pollution coverage and cleanup. Like I said, for us, it's a big part of our economy down here. And I think for those of you, again, none of this should be new, but hopefully some interesting facts or maybe just, you know, some, uh, yeah, just to, to keep you awake. But yeah, we've got many major financial institutions that do have their um, head office down here. Um, you know, so Western Cape and South Africa, the financial business sector is quite sophisticated. We're well regulated. One could argue a little bit over regulated, but we are well regulated. Um, with Alan Gray, Capite Coronation, Old Mutual, PSG, Sunlum, and Signia that have got their head office down here. Interesting as well is that, you know, we, Africa's leading technology hub, creating over 40,000 jobs, um, more jobs than Nairobi and Lagos combined. And um, yeah, fact is that 74% of economic activity in the West are Cape service related. So we can go on that ideally, you know, I mean, being a country with our literacy levels, you know, it should actually be also production, but in any event, we're not here to give an economy lesson. We're going to talk about PI today. So I think that hopefully sets the scene as to how we want to get into why we want to talk professional services. You know, there's quite a lot. We've only got an hour and then I want, you know, people to share some claims as well. And I think I've only got about five minutes, but for those of you, I, I get a nod there. I've only got five minutes. So I think for those of you, there shouldn't be, there should be, um, we don't, we really would just want to do a recap. You know, we don't want to really, I think a lot of you would have joined us on these iTuesdays before, um, uh, where we where we discuss and explore, you know, some of the products and professions we do, but yeah, you know, it's general professional services firms, you know, legal, built financial environment, um, as well as medical and allied professions, you know. So while it's medical practice um, or medical malpractice, it's, it's still a professional services, you know. And then we talk about the tradespeople, the furniture manufacturers, the electricians, etc. And 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 there, um, in terms of products, you know, there's more bespoke liability products for that, whereas we want to focus on consulting services, consulting risks. Um, and as we, most of you would know, we were just saying we, uh, a professional is charging a fee for his or her service. So just a little bit back to the advertising is that, um, you know, the sectors that we involved in is I2s, construction, financial services. You know, I've put there excluding short and brokers and independent financial advisors, law, media, and then miscellaneous are really just, you know, from auctioneers, immigration consultants, uh, tourism and travel, uh, recruitment agents, uh, not labor brokers, but recruitment agents, and then outsourcing, you know, although more prevalent in KZN, the call centers and um, customer relationship management. Real estate, you know, so you've got Pam Golding, CIF, um, Remax. I think there's another one, you know, so even some of the larger yeah, state agents that have also got their head offices down here, as well as technology, um, computer consultants, software programmers and engineers. So really, I think it, it should open up, you know, it should open up for, you know, our brokers online should really open up and, you know, sort of a, a potentially a target list of clients uh, that you can approach. So, Getting into what PI is and, you know, my colleague Marissa will um, delve into, you know, I think a little bit more detail and claims and Bonnie and Jay as well share some uh, some uh, war stories. But the trigger is actual or alleged negligence. I'm going to go, I hate talking specifically on a slide, but I always love using the word actual or alleged because you want a policy to trigger on alleged. Um, we don't want a policy to only trigger, you know, if there's actual negligence. And the idea is so that we can trigger the um, the defense costs and that we could start um, defending um, defending the matter. So, yeah, and it arises out of, out of as a, as a um, please don't use the word. The word errors and emissions insurance doesn't exist anymore. So it's really we focus on professional services, professional liability. 
And importantly, who does it cover? It, it covers the liability to third parties that flow from the services provided. And really, remember these policies, you know, where the liability um, or professional liability are really designed and driven to protect our insureds against others and not against themselves, so that we, it's difficult to insure trade losses. Um, and just going on that, how these claims arise from delict. Um, I'm not going to give, we've got some brilliant lawyers that can really delve into the leak and contract. So um, th those are two, some of the main sources for claims. And what we cover are direct and indirect damages, you know, consequential losses, what we always uh, mention, including, um, you know, the legal cost if needed to the third party. We've spoken about the defense cost that that's included. I think I'm not too sure it's somewhere some way, but it's always included in the limit. Um, you know, there was a slide, you know, how much is enough? So, because I've also used some of our previous PI slides that the, the PI team has used, you know, but I think, you know, anything less than five more, you're just wasting clients' money. Um, you know, a decent legal counsel will be, and a high court action, you know, will be a couple of million over a few years. So, yeah. Um, annually renewable and then claims made or then and then each and every on an each and every basis so but I I think those things I don't really want to hop on seeing that don't have, have a minute or so left just really want to chat on the claims made thing and I think for those of you you know for you know especially the brokers out there that that deal with clients that that go after new clients I think retroactive date is always important and when you've got a um, first of all, a, a ethical liability insurer and a good liability insurer is that where a client does have a retroactive date. So we, we're looking at where the company started um, in 2010. They only took out insurance in 2013 with work done in 2016 and a claim, you know, reported in 2017. And if the retroactive date has never been uh, moved as clients move insurers, um, essentially, you would be the, the client would be covered. Um, we might, if you do have questions, we can explore that a little bit, you know, during the Q and A session, just on that. But most of you can read, so you could just read there. But I think what I really just want to emphasize on this is that, um, you know, when you when you move a client, and I know that with an I two is where you can prove that a client has had a with I two that you can prove a client has got a, a previous retroactive uninterrupted retroactive cover is that any ethical insurer should provide that retroactive cover that the client is never exposed for moving the insurance. Um, and that only not only deals with PI, it deals with any policy that is claims made. And for those, most of you deal with um, multi-mark three commercial top um, programs, even there, you know, if, if you move, if you move your, hopefully you don't move your whole lot business, if you move it from whole lot to Suntum and you get the schedule from Suntum and retroactive date is inception. I mean, the client is being prejudiced, um, user broker being prejudiced, and you just saw earlier we don't do broker PI. So push back. Um, an ethical insurer should always provide um, a retroactive date of when um, the company started paying for liability coverage. So my last slide is um, just really the information needed. The, um, I think, you know, so the financial statement's always really helpful, but we can't really do much without a prop form. Um, you know, CVs really help, you know, brochure if the client doesn't have a website yet. And it's really, I think for our broker partners there is when you, you know, when you're an underwriter, we're underwriting something intangible. You know, we, we, we're underwriting um, mistakes that could be made. You know, we're underwriting mistakes that could be made willingly, but actually really negligence. And for us, we want to try and understand contextually what the client does, you know, um, who they are, what they do, um, where they're coming from and where they're going. I think uh, that really helps us understand the client and really ask a hell of a lot less questions at um, claim stage. So yeah, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Marissa um, that's going to chat on claims. I think let me just move on here, stop video and um, I'll first of all mute myself, I'll mute myself. So yeah, over to Marissa. Thanks Tian. Uh, good morning, everybody. So as uh, Natalie mentioned, my name is Marissa, and I have the privilege of looking after claims for I2 in the coastal region. We are very, very excited about our new claims notification platform, digital notification platform. We have been receiving quite a few requests over the, of, over the years that I've been part of I2 for claim forms. And generally, we tailor-make 
our responses and we ask the relevant questions to the relevant matter. But here, finally, we've got a claim form and we're really excited. I hope that you are all familiar with this little banner at the top of this, this first slide and that you've already grown accustomed to the claims process. If you, are, if you have any questions or any difficulties uh, on the platform, please let us know. Don't hesitate to contact us. The link is available on our website and all claims from 1 August should be notified via this platform. Thank you so much for partnering with us to uh, ensure a more efficient claims process. We are always open to feedback and um, yeah, as I said, thank you very much. We're very excited about this. So let's move on to the claims process. And I really wanna keep my session as short as possible to make way for Bonnie and Jay to tell us some interesting war stories. I'm also very um, keen to hear their, their part of the presentation. So I'll just focus on a couple of conditions that are specifically relevant to the claims process. All conditions have to be complied with, but specifically to the claims process, this is where we kick off at notification stage. The insured has an obligation to notify the insurer of all claims that they've received. This includes and extends to, if we look at that red part of the policy, um, matters where the insured becomes aware of an intent to uh, any, any, in, you know, the intention of a person to take action against the insured. And it is important to notify us as soon as possible so that we can be proactive in terms of assisting on the claims management of the process. After receiving the initial notification, we will typically request more information to consider policy response, the merits of the matter, and to determine the way forward. And some matters are particularly time sensitive and may require urgent action on our part to appoint an expert or to, to provide some practical guidance as to handling the specific matter. The importance of compliance with, with notification obligations cannot be overstated. After the notification process, the, the, the insured is under an obligation to continue to provide claims cooperation and to render to the insured all reasonable assistance in the defense of the claim. The claims cooperation includes providing information necessary to enable the insurer to investigate the loss, the substantive part of the claim, and also to, de to determine the insurer's liability under the policy. Here we could request written agreements, communication between the parties, a timeline of material events and photographs but each matter will be considered on its own merits and we will request the necessary information to, to look at this. Finally, then in terms of the conditions that I would want to discuss today, we look at the um, insurer's consent. And here it goes without saying, and it's very, very important that the insured does not admit or assume any liability. The insured should not settle a claim or incur defense costs without written consent of the insurer. Generally, we pride ourselves on being experts in the liability space. The insured will be, will be the, the expert in the specific professional field. But if we team together, we ultimately, um, you know, handle the claims well. And, and we, we have a, a fantastic opportunity to, to partner with the insured and with our panel attorneys and loss adjusters to um, help the insured through this process. So moving on to a few examples from my side, I just have to put this little disclaimer in here that all claim scenarios are presented purely as examples and real claims will be considered on their own merits against the terms and conditions of the policy, taking all specific facts of the matter into account. Sometimes you would see a small little detail, factual detail in a claim would completely turn the outcome of the matter, but Rest assured that we do the necessary investigations and we will guide yourselves and the insureds through, through the process. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So, yeah, we mentioned that uh, earlier in the presentation that we cover quite a wide, wide array of professionals in the PI space. So let's start off with a tax practitioner example. Typically, we would see here an insured who fails to submit tax returns on behalf of a client resulting in penalties and interest raised against the client as a result of the insured's professional error. The client's loss here is the interest and penalties levied against the client by SARS. 
when we hear the word penalty, I just think we should mention here that there is an exclusion for penalties under the policy, but this is not a blanket exclusion. This only this exclusion only applies to fines and penalties against the insured. In this tax practitioner example, the the interest and penalties are raised against the client and it therefore forms part of the loss and it should be covered under the policy, subject to all other terms and conditions. An example of an excluded penalty would be where a, an attorney, an insured attorney runs with the matter and a court issues what they call a cost day bonus propress order, which means that the attorney should pay the cost straight from his pocket. Generally, the, the insured client would pay costs in terms of a cost order, but if the attorney's conduct is so reprehensible that the insured finds it necessary, I think this is either load shedding. Okay, there we go. Um, the, the, the court would find it necessary to, to punish the attorney for the way in which the attorney has specifically dealt with the matter. Um, this would, would typically attract a cost day bonus propress order and it is intended to be punitive and that would then not be covered under the policy. Next slide, please. Okay, so sticking in the, in, in the attorney legal space, claims that we often see in the space uh, would be prescription of claims. Here you would have the typical scenario where a client consults with an attorney the attorney is aware of the facts of the relevant matter and simply fails for whatever reason to issue summons that would interrupt prescription, which leaves the, insure, the, the client with no remedy and no right of recourse against the actual wrongdoer. In that case, if, the, if it is proven that the client was entitled to damages under the, the let's call it the initial summons, uh, there could be a claim against the attorney for the prescribed claim. Another scenario that we see is under settlement. Here you would find a scenario where the, there's a discrepancy between the value of the claim and the, the amount that the claim was actually settled on. So attorneys are not, plaintiff's attorneys are not allowed to settle without their client's firm instructions, but the attorney is under an obligation to provide sound legal advice. So you cannot tell your client that they should accept a 2 million rand settlement offer when the claim is actually worth 20 million. Um, so that would be a scenario of under settlement, which can also be a risk and an exposure there for an insured attorney. Another interesting example that we've seen on the, the attorney in the attorney space is an anti-nuptial contract that was not registered. So the insured clients entered into an, an anti-nuptial contract. They signed the agreement, but the attorney slash notary is an, under an obligation to register the contract. The failure to register the contract only becomes apparent then at divorce stage and the party who suffers a loss as a result of the default in community of property division of the assets actually then has a claim against the attorney. Um, which, which, you know, you make one small mistake, and this is the thing in PR claims, you make one small professional error, and the implications can be very, very large. So we can't speak about attorneys without mentioning the LPIIF, the Legal Practitioners Insurance Indemnity Fund, uh, who act as the primary insurer. You will see there on the slide that they provide very limited coverage, uh, even the minimum amount the um, seems to be the minimum and maximum amount seems to be wholly inadequate uh, considering the risks that client, that attorneys face in this space. So they also have specific exclusions, absolute exclusions in respect of defamation and cybercrime that may be the, that which may enjoy cover under limited cover under a top of I2 policy. Okay, then we move on to another example of misappropriation of trust funds. The economic climate that we find ourselves in leave people desperate and very innovative, even in the criminal sense in terms of uh, funding, shall we call it additional sources of income. So here our example is that it, our insured is a firm of attorneys and conveyances. To facilitate the transfer of an estimated rate 
clearance um, uh, to facilitate facilitate the the transfer of property. An estimated rate clearance amount has to be paid to the municipality. Once the property has been transferred, the overestimated portion is refunded by the municipality. That amount belongs to the client. However, the conveyancing secretary at the firm transfers these funds into her own account instead of to the client. It doesn't matter how long employees have been working for you, uh, desperation plays a big role in, in these kind of opportunities. And often when at smaller amounts, you know, it goes undetected for quite some time, but it is definitely something that has to be actively managed and um, the payment and verification processes within a firm needs to be managed from a risk management point of view. Okay, then we move into the built environment. And here the claims are particularly interesting. Uh, you find a complex matrix of role players, all professional. You can find on one specific project, an engineer, a contractor, architects uh, or principal agents with uh, supervisory duties. When you talk about liability, you need to establish who is actually responsible for the professional error that gave rise to the loss. This example, for this example, we have an engineer who used incorrect calculations when designing a factory, which meant that the design was flawed. This resulted in the floor slabs being built at the incorrect specification and depth a dip resulting in deflection and cracks. Deflection is just movement within, with, uh, uh, on the, the, the structure, which naturally poses a couple of issues. In this example, the client held the insured liable for the remedial costs. And it, throughout the investigation process, it became apparent that the insured misunderstood the project requirements. Here we've got a substantive, I'll call it a substantive uh, design error but design errors can also arise from simple things like uh, an input error, you just use the wrong number, or there's a typographical error. Um, these are all the risks that, that the insured faces. Um, and in the, the a proper cover under the policy actually allows the insured to, to pursue what they need to do in order to um, you know, generate income. And the risk is then ultimately managed in the process. And in that way, we get to participate and share in the risk. And, you know, it's a privilege to play this role as an insurer in the functioning of, of the economy at large. Just a final risk management uh, comment from my side. In the built environment and beyond, the written agreement is of utmost importance. Here, specifically in the built environment to determine the scope of works, and to clearly agree on other aspects such as limitation of liability and the like. Communications between the parties should be reduced to writing at all, when at all possible. This helps and goes a great, helps a great deal in, in, in dealing with claims because we avoid a he said, she said situation. Thank you very much for um, for listening to this part of the presentation. We finally get to Jay and Bonnie. Jay and Bonnie, thank you so much. It's a privilege to team up with you, not only in doing this presentation, but also in terms of the substantive defense of claims against our insureds. Um, we, we, we really enjoy working with you and we appreciate you. Thank you, Marissa. Good morning, everyone. Don't talk to me, talk to my lawyer. This is a well-known line that I'm sure most of you have seen in the movies and on television, and is a line that I assume that many a professional practitioner has used. Now, as lawyers, Jay and I have come across a variety of different claims and complaints, ranging from the mundane to the unbelievable. We are trained to listen well so that we can hear what is not said. Now, this is a particular skill that we need to apply very carefully when we work with professionals. So over the course of our careers as professional indemnity and insurance lawyers, Jay and I have represented professionals in many different fields. Today, I thought it would be nice to speak to you about a couple of real life cases so that you can see 
what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, where professionals have found themselves in a bit of a pickle. Now, as I said, I've, I've met a couple of interesting individuals over the course of my career, but one that will stay with me is an engineer who I represented a couple of years ago who looked like he had stepped off a 1970s sitcom. I have learned not to judge a book by its cover. Now, this engineer was very experienced, but sadly for him, he'd been reported to the Engineering Council of South Africa for issues that had arisen with his professional services provided to a client who was in the midst of building um, a new house. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the facts. They're quite uh, simple. There were some cracks in the house. There were some water ingress problems. Um, but it became apparent to me that it was very necessary to manage this professional's expectation of the process and also his ego. Because obviously, it's not nice for anyone to be reported um, and being, being accused of professional wrongdoing and negligence. And the lesson that I learned from dealing with this engineer was to create a sense of calm, to manage that ego and the pride, and to make sure that in doing so, a successful outcome was achieved. Marissa also mentioned to you attorneys and working with attorneys who sometimes mess up. I've represented a firm of attorneys who were made up of a husband and wife duo, and they specialize in road accident fund work. And as Marissa also mentioned, it's quite common that uh, attorneys who specialize in this area of, of road accident fund work allow claims to prescribe. This is exactly what happened with this couple, and I had to plead on their behalf. So in doing so, I had to obtain detailed instructions on how things went wrong and what happened in the claim. And I realized that I would have to carefully manage and consider the instructions I received because I needed to get to the bottom of what was the actual, uh, what actually happened here. What was the, what were the real version of events? As it was clear that this husband and wife was, they were covering for each other and they were being very careful not to throw the other one under the bus. So obviously you can gather that I, I like watching a bit of TV and some movies because that reminded me of, a, of some TV series where you see the good cop and the bad cop and how they separate the two criminals in two different rooms to make sure that you get uh, the real version from each of them and they don't have an opportunity to influence each other with their versions. Just another day in the life of a lawyer. So my area of, of expertise is medical malpractice litigation and I've represented GPs, general surgeons, optetricians, gynecologists, anaesthetists and neurosurgeons amongst others. I've never even heard of a body stress relief practitioner until the instruction passed my desk a couple of years ago. Now, body stress release is something that is apparently aimed at uh, unlocking tension and uh, restoring self-healing. It's supposed to be a very natural and safe technique, and it entails a practitioner um, assessing a patient and performing massage therapy. Now, this particular practitioner who I was asked to represent in professional conduct proceedings was uh, being accused of inappropriately touching the patient and asking her to remove her underwear when she did not expect that. So again, the, the real uh, nub of what I learned from this issue was that it is so important to make sure that a practitioner appropriately communicates with his patient or client. So if the patient in this example had just obtained detailed information from the practitioners on what the practitioner's intention was and what methods the practitioner was going to employ in conducting the assessment, he would not have found himself in this embarrassing situation that he had to explain himself to a professional conduct inquiry committee. So again, communication, communication, communication. This is absolutely key. Where medical practitioners are concerned, this entails a thorough explanation of what a patient can expect and also an explanation to the patient's families. The, what the examination entails and what assessments are going to be done on the patient needs to be explained to the patient. And then of course, the issue of informed consent is always important and a practitioner need, needs to, to in detail explain to the patient what they are consenting for before the patient can give that consent. Now, it might sound like a touchy-feely part and an unimportant part of professional practice to make sure that communication is, is correct. But believe me, if there's one thing that I can preach it is that clear communication can prevent many claims and complaints against pro professionals. A case which has stayed with me and which demonstrates the importance of sufficient and comprehensive professional indemnity cover 
was the case of baby X. Now, baby X was quite sadly born with a congenital heart defect, and he was very, very ill, requiring specialist medical care to save his life. It was recommended that he receive treatment by way of an ECMO machine, which is an extracorporeal membra membrane oxygenation machine. It's similar to a heart-lung bypass machine, which is used in open heart surgery, and it essentially pumps and oxygenates blood outside of a patient's body to allow the heart and the lungs to rest. Now, at the time of this baby X receiving treatment and requiring this treatment, ECMO was at the height of medical technology, at least in South Africa. There were only one or two machines available in the country, and the doctors who made use of the, these machines were super specialists in their field, and the nurses who had been trained to work with these machines had to undergo intense sessions to ensure that they understood the functioning of the machine and the potential pitfalls once the machine was up and running and connected to the patient. Now, very sadly, Baby X died as a result of an air bubble that had found its way into the tubing of this machine, and it eventually lodged in his heart, resulting in his death due to an air embolism. Now, how I got involved in this case was I was asked to represent the practitioner in inquest proceedings. So these are proceedings that are required by statute, by the Inquest Act. And the Inquest Act requires that any unnatural death needs to be um, assessed in terms of the Inquest Act. And an unnatural death in the case of medical setting is usually referred to as an anesthetic death, but it's considered unnatural speci specifically because here it was a, a couple day old baby who died. The proceedings are very important and they require intense preparation and the best experts um, on, in the legal field, in the legal space, and also the medical experts to support the practitioner who is sort of under, under examination and under questioning. And an adverse finding after inquest proceedings can result in criminal prosecution. So it really is important that uh, the, the inquest proceedings are approached uh, correctly and with the necessary seriousness. Now, the policy in this situation covered the practitioner who I represented, and it became apparent during my investigations that I could not find anyone in South Africa who was able to assist the practitioner as an expert at these proceedings. I eventually found someone based in, in the UK. It was a, a professor in cardiothoracic pediatric surgery who had worked with ECMO before, and ECMO was a machine that was quite uh, available in the UK, so it wasn't such a specialized niche field as it was in South Africa. He had quite a plausible theory on how the air bubble entered the circuit, um, which was a negative pressure issue coupled with clamping of the line, etc. And eventually this theory, we had to fly him um, into the proceedings from the UK. His theory when he testified exonerated the medical practitioners and the nurses from any wrongdoing and findings of professional negligence as it came down to the functioning of the machine, which no one could have expected or could have prevented. Another interesting example in the medical context that I think you could find interesting was when I was asked to represent a general practitioner who had been consulted by a mother of two young children. They were aged approximately five months and two years old, and they presented with some common cold and flu symptoms. Now, after examination, the GP suggested that these children require antibiotic treatment, they're a bit ill, and as some of you may know, administering antibiotics to children um, is not the easiest thing. They are uh, required to ingest the antibiotics orally. It's usually in the form of a, of a syrup. And how these antibiotics are mixed is uh, it comes in a powder format and the pharmacist or the doctor mixes the antibiotic powder with sterile water, which is then administered to the child with a syringe. Now this all played out in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And for reasons with which the practitioner could not explain, she ended up mixing the antibiotic powder with hand sanitizer instead of sterile water. She didn't make, she didn't notice this mistake until the mother contacted her a couple of days later saying that the children weren't getting any better. They were actually getting sicker. And this antibiotic formula smelt very strongly and very strangely. So I think they picked up the problem and the children were rushed to the nearby uh, clinic where their stomachs had to be pumped and they had to get emergency treatment because obviously ingesting hand sanitizer is not a good thing to do, especially for such little children. Luckily, the kids got better and the crisis was averted, but this GP was extremely grateful for the assistance that she was given, that the policy responded uh, during the process of demand and that she got legal assistance with communicating and corresponding with the mother during this, this time, even before a summons was received. 
So again, it was just clear that notifying early on when an incident occurred, if a practitioner knows that there's a problem, get legal assistance quickly. An understanding of the policy wording and of your client's business and what your client needs from professional indemnity cover is super important. So from our side, make sure that you keep a finger on the pulse of your client's business, make sure that the policy covers everything that the professional requires in, in his policy, and make sure that the clients know that they need to advise you as soon as an incident arises, which is what Marissa also mentioned to you earlier. It is just so important that from an early stage that the client is given the option to lawyer up, that the client is given the opportunity uh, that assistance is provided with practical uh, issues such as corresponding, answering of emails, submitting claims. Um, but my parting shot to you is that it is simply never too early to consult a lawyer when something has gone wrong. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jay Page now. Stop my All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about power. It is a concept, an idea, it's an issue which comes up often. It's often one of the very first things that I speak to when I consult with professionals who are having some trouble, where there's a complaint or with a potential issue on the horizon. And there's often a misconception about who holds the power. So between the professional and their clients, who do you imagine holds the power? And how should this dictate their behavior? Uh, in my experience, there's a, a misconception um, often about who actually holds the power. Um, there's this idea that it's the professional that holds the power by virtue of their you know, their status, their qualifications, uh, their knowledge, their associations, or their, their understanding. Uh, but more often than not, in my experience, when something goes wrong, it's actually the client that holds the power, oftentimes because they have nothing to lose, whereas the professional has much to lose. I'm going to share uh, a few cases um, that I've dealt with over the last uh, few years. Uh, to illustrate uh, this concept. Um, every good story needs a good villain. I can't use the real names or likeness uh, of the actual uh, persons involved, but I'll start with this person, this villain. Let's call him Stefano. Now, Stefano was a middle-aged man. Uh, he was in the professional services, financial services environment, but not a professional himself, but he had, he had done quite well over the years built up a good reputation and uh, like many middle-aged men he is starting to have some back problems and he sought out some professional help uh, with a physiotherapist in private practice let's call her Marlena so Stefano and Marlena's relationship started off like any typical professional relationship they would <clears throat> communicate via whatsapp and started off very professional. Um, they would text each other to confirm appointments. Um, the Marlena would check in on Stefano, how his back was feeling after the treatment. Um, and they continued in this vein <clears throat> for several months. Um, and as they as their relationship grew, they discovered they had quite a bit in common. Uh, they were both going through you know difficult divorces. They each had children. Um, and from that experience over the course of, I would say, a year, uh, they built up a friendship. Eventually, uh, Stefano mustered up the courage to ask Marlena out, and they had a date. And the date was, in his words, magic. And he confessed that he had liked her for, from the moment he saw her. And uh, he was just grateful that uh, she now knew his secret. 
And from there, their relationship grew. <clears throat> and six months later, they bought a house and they moved in together. And um, that's when the problem started. Um, they had some petty squabbles, uh, some more serious ones. Um, there were children involved. They had both had very messy past relationships. And ultimately, it wasn't working. And they decided to part ways. But um, <coughs> he was very unhappy with this. And Stefano became jilted, a little bit obsessive, and ultimately a little bit crazy. So you won't believe what happened next. So almost 18 months after treatment began, Stefano, who was now very upset that he had now to move out of this house and had all these financial problems, he was paying two bonds, he decided to go on the offensive. And because Marlena was a professional, regulated by the Health Professions Council of South Africa, he had a target and she was vulnerable. So he started off with her online reputation and all of a sudden, her Google reviews were flooded with negative reviews, one-star reviews from many anonymous accounts. But obviously, it was him. He also ran to court to get a protection order against her. And if, if anybody knows how these things work, you get an interim protection order, which you don't even need to tell the other side that, you, that you're doing it. You just go to court, you fill out an affidavit, which is pretty much a form, and the magistrate looks or she doesn't look very closely at it and will grant you the order on condition that you know it must still be confirmed but with this interim protection order you now have someone from the court that says this person cannot come within a certain radius of you and whatever other conditions they are and he used that um to great effect because uh he then pitched up at the home and <laughs> When she tried to, and he locked himself in the room. And so when she tried to enter the room, he called the police. In addition to that, he laid a complaint with the Health Professions Council. And this is where we became involved. Um, she was now in, embroiled in a an HPCSA complaint. And in this complaint, he alleged that during their sessions, she had seduced him forced him to leave his wife and engaged in all sorts of um, explicit acts with him in the rooms whilst other patients were in the waiting room um, and how she used their relationship, the doctor-patient relationship to manipulate him uh, into sleeping with her. And that was his story. And um, we, it's quite a serious charge. It's quite a sensational charge. So you can imagine that the health committee was, I, I think, just interested in the story, captivated by the by the detail in, in, in his in his story. So we actually had to go to an inquiry and to defend her at an inquiry because it's considered inappropriate to have a relationship with a patient. And for an entire day, the physiotherapist Marlena had to sit through and listen to him explain in detail uh, all the acts that took place, how she had seduced him allegedly, and when, and over the course of all the months. And we let him talk, and we let him tell his story for an entire day. And in the background, we had, I think it was 16 lever arch files, which uh, he didn't know we had. And the next day, we asked him to turn over one of the files and in those files were more than 800 pages of whatsapp communication between the two of them and in it it details the course of their relationship from start to finish so we were very fortunate to have that that evidence and it rebutted everything that he said he explained how at one point about three months into the treatment relationship he had said the day before that they had sex on the floor of the treatment room. But we had WhatsApp communication from 11 months after that, where he explained how he had to imagine seeing her naked because he had never seen her naked before. 
So we were able to completely discredit him. And thankfully, that was a positive outcome. But you can see how the power dynamic played out between this individual, a malicious individual, and a professional. Vulnerable because they have a, they have a business, they have an online practice, they have a reputation, and they're regulated. They are subject to, to disciplinary inquiry. And that's a, a sad tale. Um, but it also shows how important it is to have the right support there because she could easily have been found guilty um, if she didn't have the necessary expertise to protect herself. There was also a civil claim that he brought, um, all sorts of things. But uh, you know, the most funny thing is that he claimed the return of, of two towels valued at 50 rand each. His bright tongs. 40 rand each, uh, valued at 100 rand, and all sorts of miscellaneous items. Just a malicious individual. Thankfully, because we were successful in defending the prosecution, and because um, he so clearly had lied, we were able to bring a counterclaim for the legal expenses uh, incurred uh, in defending this malicious prosecution, and we used that uh, to resolve the, 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 rest of, the rest of the issues. Um, so that has a positive outcome, but nevertheless, it was years uh, of time in this professional's life that, were lo that was lost. Um, the next adversary that I want to discuss, let's call her Marge. This is a very accurate depiction of her. Um, Marge's mom, very elderly, during the height of COVID, went into hospital. She was severely ill. In fact, they could only offer palliative care, and the physician um, oversaw her, her mom for the next over the next three months, and then she eventually passed away. But Marge could not handle it, and Marge then went on a spree of harassment. It's been it's now been um, about three years. In that time, Marge has laid more than six complaints against just the physician. She's laid more than 30 complaints against 20 other medical practitioners. Everyone that might even tangentially have been involved in her mother's case, the dietitian, the, psycho the psychologist who sent one letter, and so on and so forth. She is very clever. Um, she would, one of, her, one of her methods was to request records in terms of the promotion um, of Access to Information Act. And when the busy professional uh, was late in providing her with a reply, she would then immediately complain to the information regulator and also to the HBCSA. Um, you can just imagine the costs involved for, for all parties, not only just in time, but also the literal legal cost in defending these regulatory complaints because regulators do not have typically do not have mechanisms to filter out complaints or to not investigate complaints. They have to investigate them. Um, and this is actually ongoing. Um, I will say this, there are, she's also laid criminal charges, um, including against me. So I'm now also in her, in, her, in her line of sight. There's a complaint to the legal practice council against me as well for what she calls witness um, tampering or witness intimidation. Um, so because she, unbeknownst to everyone, actually had gone to the police and led a ch charge of couple of homicide against the doctor, um, when I wrote to her to ask her to refrain from continuously complaining and harassing him, uh, that to her was uh, witness tampering. Um, so there are some outstanding charges against me as well. Um, and it's funny, I got a call from another attorney who's also assisting her, and she's now also fears that she will be the next the next victim. So Marge might look harmless, but she holds all the power because she has absolutely nothing to lose. And the mechanisms that she is in, that she employs are they cost her nothing except for her time and she has nothing but time. To bring this matter to a head, we've now launched proceedings um, in terms of the Harassment Act to obtain a protection order. It's relatively novel because typically the starting point is that people do have a right to complain. Um, and it's very interesting to, well, the court will have to determine when one's right to complain um, uh, is limited. 
and it starts turning into harassment. Uh, and hopefully we will get an outcome in October. Uh, for now, she's had to appear at court on a few occasions. Uh, she's At the moment, she's complaining that she has no legal assistance, even though she's able to conduct this harassment spree uh, quite, quite competently. Um, but we will have a, a hearing in October uh, to decide that application, and hopefully that will be the end of March. All right, now I want, I want to give one more example, um, because you always need to have an exception to the rule. And um, this is an interesting case. We were approached by um, a client who provides storage facilities, and it's obviously highly specialized storage facilities for chemicals. And they engaged uh, a series of professionals to upgrade and to rebuild their storage uh, facilities. Um, obviously, it's a very highly regulated um, exercise. And it turned out that this particular expert or uh, professional that they employed ultimately did not build the 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 storage uh, silo silos to the appropriate specifications so that they were actually that their capacity was actually short uh, lower than what they should have been. And we were approached to advise on uh, the client's uh, remedies and how they might um, recover from this from this or recover some sort of damages. The interesting part of this case is that the client hadn't actually used the capacity, the excess capacity. So it took them a while to realize that the silo wasn't built to specification. Their problem was that their customers, they had contracted with their customers and their customers required a certain capacity, but that capacity had never been used until now, until the moment that they realized uh, now we actually need the excess capacity. So they actually had no damages. They actually suffered no loss up until the point that they realized uh, this issue. And um, it's funny because it reminds me of a reminded me of a case, a very interesting UK case, which I think you can debate for for a long time, but it's kind of relatable. Um, someone contracted with with a uh, with a team, a professional team, to build a pool at home, and the pool was meant to be built to seven uh, to a depth of seven foot three inches. And the pool was built to this to six feet and nine inches. And the customer sued. And the question was whether they could recover and what could they re recover? Because it was common cause that the value of the pool being seven foot or being six foot nine was the same either way. But at the same time, you didn't get what you contracted for. So it was an interesting case. And um, yeah, uh, it inspired a lot of debate as to what was the right thing to do. The the customer wanted the full cost to rebuild the pool to his specification because that's what he paid for. That's what he wanted. Um, whereas the the engineer argued that you know the pool there was no there was no difference to be made, and to pay the client the full amount to rebuild this entire pool would be out of proportion with what his losses were, which is actually zero um in the end the court just awarded a nominal amount for the inconvenience but argued that they agreed that it would be disproportionate to pay the client the, the full amount uh, but it still feels wrong because if you contract to get a seven seven foot pool and you get and you get something other than what you contracted for one would think you'd you'd want you'd you'd be put in the position to get what you paid for um that was an interesting judgment very similar uh, to the to the case of this engineer, but where the power dynamic comes in is that the client made the error of contracting, of not checking out who they contracted with. And this contractor did not have PI cover. Not only that, he had no assets to his name. And in the end, it was not worthwhile pursuing. So there, in that case, the person with nothing to lose um, was the professional. Now, that's not an invitation to avoid claims uh, by not having cover because I've come across more than one case where clients had to sell a home 
um, to cover a damages claim because they were not insured. So insurance is is important. Um, and you don't want your client to be uh, this kind of engineer. All right, so I'm going to finish off with some takeaways. I see we've, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, a client that feels harm often has nothing to lose. So you need to know and understand where the power truly lies. Um, if you appreciate that the power lies with the client, then at the outset, once there is an issue, your approach to that client has to be um, reconciliatory. You need to take a, a very careful approach. You need to apologize where appropriate. Um, and really your communication needs to be excellent from the outset. And almost every matter where we become involved after the professional has tried to deal with it, him or herself, um, that's typically where, where the matter's already escalated and now you're defending a claim. Whereas even the most crazy scenarios can, can a claim can be avoided. Um, so what I want to leave you with, and I think it echoes what Marissa said and what Bonnie said, is that professionals, however accomplished, you need expert support and assistance at the outset. Uh, the lawyer who defends himself has a fool for a client. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So um, just want to say thanks to Bonnie and Jay for brilliant presentations. Marissa, your claims experience was really well and very much enjoyed. I don't think we've got any questions that we still need to answer. If there are any, you're welcome to email either myself or Marissa, and we will do our best to get back to you. Um, yeah, it was really, thank you. We had more than 700 brokers. So we truly appreciate you attending today. And we look forward to seeing you all on our next iTuesday presentation. Have a wonderful Tuesday, everyone. Just a quick one. A thank you to the brokers that attended on Teams as well. We just had over 300 brokers on Teams. So thank you to everybody. Oh, brilliant. And thank you for everybody that stayed over. We apologize that we've gone a little bit over time. But for anybody that's missed part of the session, it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Tove. And yeah, thanks again for all the brokers on Teams and on Zoom. We will see you next Tuesday. Have Thank a you. great week, everyone. Well done, thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.